we survived some technical difficulties already, so <laughs> that's good for resilience. Um, so as she just explained, I'm going to talk about making better mistakes tomorrow. Uh, and I wanted to start with, maybe you're wondering who, who I am, but I think she sort of gave some of that away, but I'll go through it just really quickly anyway. Uh, so who am I? Uh, so I'm originally from here, California. Um, this uh, San Diego, this is literally what it looks like every single day. Um, but then I, I ended up living here now, and that's literally, <laughs> that is literally what it looks like sometimes. Uh, and I know this doesn't talk about making better mistakes and failures, but I, I don't consider this to be one of them actually, even though you, you all might. Um, so what, what was it that brought me to Sweden? And uh, that would be um, Spotify. So for those of you who don't know, Spotify is a, a streaming music service. So whether you're on your desktop in your web browser, on your phone or your tablet, um, you can log into the app and stream a song, one of over 30 million songs. And, uh, is this me? Okay, anyway, um, so Spotify, we have over 40 million pay, uh, or people on uh, paid subscription plans. That's as of last month. Um, we have over 100 million active users, which means that um, uh, once a month they, they log into Spotify and play a song. So that's uh, 100 million people as of June 2016. Uh, we paid over $5 billion, US dollars, to rights holders since we started. Uh, and there are over 2 billion playlists on Spotify, and we're available in 60 countries, including Singapore. <laughs> So what do I do at Spotify? So I started as a software engineer, so I was working on data infrastructure. And it was my first time working uh, with Agile, and I really liked it. I liked the approach of breaking things down uh, into bite-sized pieces that were much easier to uh, attack and digest and, and get feedback on quickly. And I liked the Agile processes. I really liked um, retrospectives and the ability to constantly be looking at and questioning the way that we're working and how we can be doing it better. So when we, um, when we lost our Agile coach and we switched to another team, I didn't want for, I didn't want my squad, which is what we call teams at Spotify, to uh, to lose that Agile uh, influence. So I took on more and more of that role within my squad. So I was doing development work, but I was also running retrospectives and facilitating stand-ups and such. And over time, I started to take on more of that work, and a little bit more, and a little bit more, and I ended up liking it so much more that I switched to being an Agile coach. So I was working in infrastructure with security teams and a, a site reliability engineering team, and then I switched into payments. And now I'm, a, I'm an agile coach and also an interim mobile chapter lead, which means that I'm an engineering manager for mobile engineers and payments. Uh, and I think what this underscores is that if, if we didn't have this culture at Spotify where it was okay to be a total beginner, right? Like my, my background is in back end engineering and now I'm a mobile, uh, mobile engineering chapter lead. So if I didn't have if I didn't feel safe looking like a total beginner asking questions that some people might consider really dumb questions, I think uh, a lot of the stuff that makes me start to great would, would, uh, would fail. So I think this really points to that. So we've all witnessed the downfall of companies that were once great. I don't have to name names. I'm sure a bunch come to mind when you, when you think about it. And um, this is often due to, to companies not keeping up with changing market conditions, whether it's changing demographics or, or failing to capitalize on a new technology. Um, these companies that were once considered these, these great titans that can never be taken down, um, some of them aren't even in existence today. And a common theme there is the failure to innovate um, with, uh, in, in a variety of dimensions, whatever it is that it always comes back to not keeping up with the trends, not taking risks, and not moving as the market moves. So I think a lot of, I don't know if anyone's seen this before, but this is one of my favorite graphics. Uh, so when we're on the outside looking in to these companies, which are which are great successes, they're, they're black boxes to us in a lot of ways. Um, we only really see the highlights reel. We see, we hear about where they started, and we see all the successes they've had a lot along the way, and we don't see the failures, or sometimes when they've had to swerve left and then come back to the right and something they thought was really going to work out didn't work out. Um, so we think success, at least on the outside, we, what people think it looks like is just a straight line from A to B. We know where we're going from day one and we persevere and we get there. But in reality, we're learning along the way um, and not always going 
directly towards the goal, so to speak. So we need to make sure that we need we leave enough wiggle room, not only in terms of time to develop things, because as anyone who's an engineer here knows uh, how long you think something's going to take versus when you actually start digging into the to the um, the components of, of how it's working today uh, ends up taking a lot more time than, than we think. Uh, and also, like leaving wiggle room not just in terms of time, but in terms of the creative process. So being open to new ideas, new influences, uh, being really perceptive to learning new things as they pop up. So um, part of this comes back to like the tolerance for failure. And, and um, does anyone recognize this? Does anyone know what it is? Not yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Alexander Fleming was trying to, he was doing research on how to, how to find an antibiotic. Uh, and he went away on vacation for a few weeks, and when he came back, he noticed that this is what his petri dish looked like. There was some foreign mold growing into, in it. And instead of saying, oh, now my experiment that I've been waiting weeks for the results for has been contaminated, I need to throw this out and start again, he took a more inquisitive approach. And he said, okay, what is this stuff actually? What's going on here? And when he, when he started taking a closer look, he noticed that the bacteria, even though it was growing in, in this region of it, anything, anything near the penicillin or this uh, mystery mold, whatever it was, uh, if the bacteria was actually dying. And so by having an open mind and taking an, an inquisitive approach, and instead of just throwing out his, um, his uh, research just because it wasn't going exactly according to what he had planned, he was able to discover that this, um, that this penicillin actually could kill the bacteria. And as a result, it was the world's antibiotic, and probably one of the, the foremost innovations in medicine of the 20th century. So he says, when I woke up just after dawn on September 28, 1928, I certainly didn't plan to revolutionize all medicine by discovering the world's first antibiotic or bacteria killer. But I guess that was exactly what I did. So um, in many ways, this, uh, this underscores this, this mentality of trying to have a learning culture of being adaptive to failure um, and not, not thinking, okay, just because I, I'm not where I wanted to be starting out, uh, what am I learning along the way and how can that help me uh, get faster to a, to a point of success. So again, one of the foremost medical innovations in, uh, in the 20th century uh, saved lots and lots of lives. So this mindset, how can we make it core to the fabric of our world working culture? It's really easy for me to stand up here and say, oh, this is really important, we should all embrace failure. It's a very easy thing to do, but in practice it can be much harder. So I call it the learning culture. Um, when I when I talked about, or when I was thinking about this talk originally, I talked a lot about failure. Oh, it's okay to fail, it's Spotify. But um, I think the uh, phrasing it more as a learning culture is much more accurate, and, and uh, it's not just about you know wanting to fail, it's about wanting to learn from everything, even from our successes. So it's always about like being observant and um, trying to pick up the things we can along the way. So of organizations that have a high impact learning culture, so there are 46 percent more likely to be first to market, 34 percent have better response to customer needs, and 37 percent greater employer productivity. So maybe you find this a little bit ironic because the, the ones that actually uh, are failing more are, are leaving more time and don't know exactly where they're going, even though in scenario A, if you know exactly where you're going or where you think you're supposed to be, you might get there quicker, but it's the ones who take time and allow the learning process to blossom that end up um, prospering more. So while the old mentality might have been how can we avoid making mistakes, uh, mistakes are ultimately inevitable and they're really fundamental to putting forth the best, um, the best product that we can. We try and think about it in terms of how can we make better mistakes. So not just in terms of uh, product things, but how can we how can we learn faster? Even if we are learning and moving towards the right direction, how can we learn even faster? Um, are we are we innovating enough? Um, are, yeah, are we growing people also? Are people, are we giving people the opportunity to grow from an engineer into maybe a, a product owner or a, an engineering manager? Um, because th that's also a part of it. It's not just about the product, it's about the people also. So at Spotify, we call it the think it, build it, ship it, tweak it mindset. So uh, basically what this means is, 
So we're thinking of a, a feature, let's say. So we go, we talk to a lot of stakeholders, we try, we talk to customers, we talk to other people internally and try and understand, okay, what is it that actually should be part of this product? And once we've gathered all those requirements and have talked about it and challenged it, um, then we build something. And then we ship it, and from there we tweak it. So we're, we're gathering data all the time, and then based on how users are interacting with the feature, we might you know, see, okay, people are really liking this aspect. How can we, how can we replicate this? Or, oh, this really isn't working. Like, let's, let's come back and, and rethink it. And so this is a very different approach from saying, we have the perfect idea, and this is it, and this is what we're going to do. So spending months and months building out the perfect product. It's much more about saying, okay, let's try this. What can we learn from it? What can we, what can, how can we make it work? Let's gather data and see if our intuitions are right. So, um, so with this mindset pervading the culture, it makes it so that you know people aren't afraid to be wrong because even from the from the get-go, it's not about having the perfect thing and it's not about being right. It's about how can we as a team uh, tackle this problem and bring forth what what will be the best for for the user and the customer. Uh, this also isn't the I don't know if you've heard that term, the highest paid person's opinion. So this is also isn't saying that, oh, just because this person is the director of, of product, that whatever they say goes. It's also, you know, they also have to, um, to ha uh, be able to pull the data from things that, the products that they push forward, and if those aren't working, it doesn't matter if you're the CEO or an engineer, um, we go by the data. So an example of that, this is our old Discover feature. Um, and it basically gives you suggestions. So based on your listening history, um, sometimes it will show you songs that you've had not listened to in a while that maybe, I don't know, you kind of miss listening to and, and what, your, what, your, um, what your friends listen to also. Um, and um, yeah, so this, like the, the algorithms that were powering this, right, like they were fundamentally very strong. Uh, but the problem is that this, this feature was hidden so deeply into the product that A, it was hard to find. Uh, and also, it was a very much like a, a lean-in approach. It takes, you know, you, you really have to be, as a user, you really have to be the one driving it. So, so that's another factor kind of against it. So even though um, the people who did interact with it really loved the recommendations, there were other factors that just that made it not a perfect fit. Does anyone know? what Discover Weekly is. Has anyone listened to their Discover Weekly? One person, okay. <laughs> Two people, three. Um, so Discover Weekly is basically, uh, we've, we've taken the Discover uh, algorithms that we had and using the think it, um, build it, ship it, tweak it mentality, we've been able to turn it into something that people love, or at least the people who love it. <laughs> Um, but what it is is that we've taken the same algorithms and instead of having the user first try and find the, find the page that the, um, the feature was on and, and have to interact with it, every Monday, so once a week, they get 30 songs that are based on their, their listening history and songs that they that they'll like and then obviously like as we see what they listen to, that the algorithm can grow and change with that. Um, and this has been one of our recent like, hit features and I personally really like it. Um, so it's taking it away from being like uh, someone really having to lean in and interact with the product to kind of like the more sit back experience where it comes to you and it's, a, it's on a weekly cadence so you know what to expect it, etc. cetera. But um, how did we get there? So this is actually, this is started in 2014 but I took the screen from 2015. So we did something called Year of Music. And so for everyone, for every Spotify user, they can go onto this website and at the end of the year, and they can see, okay, what were their top 10 artists and what were their top genres and what were their favorite songs that they listened to, etc. So it's really cool to, um, at the end of the day, take a look back and see, see what it was you were listening to. Um, we also decided to give them a, some, a little something extra, something called Play It Forward. So this was built on top of the Discover, the algorithms that were powering the Discover feature. Um, and it basically was kind of a test of this playlist concept. And people loved to play it forward. Um, the engagement with it was, was really great. So we realized that, okay, maybe, maybe we're right. Maybe the, the actual song suggestions that we're making are fundamentally good. 
but it's the way that we are presenting them to people that, that's flawed. And so by taking this, um, by testing things out a little bit and taking this uh, discover feature and a playlist concept, we were able to turn it into Discover Weekly, which I can highly re recommend checking out if you're a Spotify user. Um, so again, think it, build it, ship it, tweak it mentality. Um, if you want to know more about the Discover Weekly in particular, I know these are, I don't expect that you'll memorize these links, but that would be pretty impressive if you could. Um, I'll have these slides up online also, but you could go to labs.spotify.com or search on SlideShare for Discover Weekly if you want to know more about the, um, the product side of things. Um, as an extra bonus, we have something that's similar to Discover Weekly, which is called Release Raider. So basically using your interests and um, the some new songs that are being released to curate a playlist for you of like all the new songs that are coming out, which I really like. Um, so yeah, that's our learning culture and practice. But how do we, again, how do we actually get there, right? Um, what are some of the tactics that we use? So one is retrospective. This is an agile conference, so I imagine everyone in the room is at least familiar with the retrospective. Um, something I always really like is this process of having this weekly cadence of looking back and saying, okay, how can we make this better and how can we improve what we're doing? Uh, there are lots of great resources online for retrospectives, so I won't go into too much here, but that is definitely one of the main tools we use to get into that like uh, learning culture mindset. Another big thing we use are postmortems. So postmortems are more, does anyone here run postmortems? Yeah, a few people. So these are more for like system failures. So this is an example of when the Hadoop uh, research manager was slow. And what we do is we notice that there's either a failure or a problem and we have, and an incident ticket is created. And after that, we'll have a postmortem, which is sort of like a retrospective of focusing specifically on the timeline of, okay, what went wrong and how can we improve it? And we, and we walk away with some specific remediations. Um, we try and focus on, okay, what are just a few actionable ones you can take? They're definitely, uh, oh. Um, so, yeah, we try and focus on, on getting just a few remediations done, but this is another way that we try to keep the learning culture alive and well. So some of the goals of postmortems are obviously figuring out what happened, commuting things with stakeholders, um, how we can learn from it. Uh, but, but nowhere in here will you see, okay, we're having a speedy to figure out who to blame. This is it's not a blame thing at all. It's about people, no matter how it happens, it's about people coming together to figure out how can we make sure this doesn't happen again. Um, because it's okay for mistakes to happen, and it's okay for us to fail in things, but we just make, want to make sure we don't have the same failure twice. So the goal of, the, of a postmortem isn't to make sure we never have mistakes, but to make sure that we have a different mistake next time for the next postmortem. Um, but there are many ways to learn from failure after the fact, and I think while well, these two, while well, postmortems and retrospectives are two great ways to get into the habit of doing this and to establish a cadence around it, um, how can we actually make sure we get to the point where people feel safe being in a meeting with the head of their engineering department and telling them, no, this, like, I don't agree with, with the way we did this, or this was wrong, or, or like, feeling empowered to say those kind of things. Uh, so now I have my guide. Uh, build a learning culture in three easy steps, <laughs> and maybe a few hard ones, but. <laughs> uh, so I boiled it down basically to filtering, uh, reinforcing and adjusting and reiterating. So those are sort of the main themes of how do you actually get to this point where where you have people learn different things, people aren't afraid to make a mistake and they aren't afraid to innovate and try something new. Uh, so I'll walk through these and give some uh, concrete examples of things that we do. And we'll start first with filtering. So the first thing we do is culture interview. Who here does culture interviews at their company? Some people. Uh, who here doesn't like raising their hand? No, just kidding. Okay, um, so culture interview is all about getting the right people in the building. And the right people for Spotify could be someone very different from the right people for another company. So it's a lot about knowing, okay, what are our core values here? And not just the ones that we say are core, but the ones that we are like living every single day. Um, some of our engineering principles are what are people principles of cultural beliefs are, what you can become matters more than what you are. So for us, it's not always about hiring someone who might have 
20 years of experience as a sysadmin. It's, it's um, more often than not, we, we hire someone who really uh, is always wants to continuously improve, um, is, is not afraid to fail and innovate as a team player. Some of those things are pretty important to us. And maybe they don't have all the experience, but we take them in and we, we say, okay, we want to work with you and we want to grow you into becoming like the person that you can be. So it's, it's uh, and especially in like a highly uh, competitive hiring market state, or marketplace like in, like in tech, it can be hard to find uh, people with all the experience that, that you want. So we definitely take a more like growing people approach. Uh, but we, we take people on once we have, have assured that they kind of have the same cultural, like same sort of mindset we have about uh, not being afraid to fail, fail about that, you know, they don't, we're really big on like no ego. So we don't, you know, we're not always looking for superstars. We're looking for great people, obviously, but we want to build rockstar teams. Um, that's kind of the priority for us. So, so that's something that we filter for. Um, Another thing, whoever learns the fastest will win. So um, it's about like, a, a lot about like being able to learn from failure. And um, we try to make sure that the people who come in, as I said before, are people who are, who are okay with this. Uh, so a lot of, if you can get this part down, like getting the right people in, in the building, then a lot of the rest of, of stuff, especially when it comes to management, is much easier. Uh, so the first step in order to build a learning culture is to filter for people who um, sort of have the system of, of their beliefs or who, who aren't afraid of this. So step two, feedback. Um, I call something Spotify bingo if I hear it all the time at work, so it's like kind of my own inside joke, but something that you'll hear a lot of at Spotify is have you given them that feedback? So um, I'm sure you probably have it at your own company too, like things that you hear people say a lot. So something that, um, so let's say, even if it's like, oh, this person did a really great job, you can tell that to maybe a manager, they'll say, okay, but have you given that, them that feedback? They're not, uh, they're kind of training us not to funnel the feedback into one person, but to always be uh, telling people when we think they did a great job and when we think something could have gone better. So I think that's one thing that helps with the, keeping a daily practice of like, uh, making sure that people are, are giving feedback. Because it's one thing to get, the right people in the building, but no one's ever going to be um, going to be perfectly in line with like what the cultural principles at, at um, your company are. So it's a lot, a lot about like reinforcing good behavior and also adjusting. Maybe when someone, you know, you notice that they're really staying in their safe zone and they're not really taking taking risks. You know, that's another that's an opportunity to try and adjust them and get them to take on a bigger a bigger risk. Um, another process we have is loops, which is a more formal feedback. Um, so you have achievements on one axis on, and behavior on the other. And um, something, some things that we try and think about are like some of the some of the questions that come to mind when we're giving this this uh, six to twelve month feedback is like, do you see evidence that they have ambition to continuously grow and develop both as a person and a professional? So trying to get people. Um, who are getting feedback to people to think about, is this person challenging themselves? Are they continuously improving? Uh, both their technical skills, but also as people. You know, maybe, I don't know, maybe they are um, QA, a QA, and they are you know, trying to push them into more of a product role to try and understand that perspective. Um, again, another thing about seeking opportunities to grow, um, do they undertake challenges that they have never taken before, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So, um, trying to get people when they're giving us feedback to think about some of these things so that we can all kind of stay, you know, be singing the same, the same tune, so to speak. So, this is again about taking taking an opportunity every six to twelve months to say, okay, where do you see that this person is doing a great job in terms of, of learning from, from mistakes and taking risks? and like making sure that people reinforce that good behavior and also uh, getting getting the people around them to think about, okay, but where could this person be doing an even better job? So step one, get the, get the right people in the building. Step two, make sure you're helping them grow along, the, along those lines. Um, the next one is modeling behavior. And this goes for both like engineer all the way up to like your CTO and your CEO. So 
most human behavior is learned observationally through modeling. So Alpha Prender, he's a, he's a researcher, and he did an experiment called the Bobo doll experiment. And what he did was that he took uh, some young boys and girls and he, um, and he had them watch these, uh, these people go into a room. And some of the people, they would be neutral and they would just you know, kind of look at the stall, whatever. Some people would go in and they would be really friendly and helpful, very, very like non-aggressive behavior. And some people would go in and they would start to hit it and shoot things at it and all the other things. So, so like, ex like exhibiting really aggressive behavior. And then after that what happened was they sent the kids into the room to play with the doll. Um, and what they noticed is that the ones who had seen really aggressive behavior were more likely to repeat that aggressive behavior themselves when they were playing with the doll. And the ones who had seen kind of non-aggressive behavior when they went into the room were more likely to not exhibit aggressive behavior. So they were more on the non-aggressive side. So what, um, what that underscores is that we really do learn a lot from like, the behavior around us, from what other people are doing. So if you want a culture in which it's, it's okay to failure, it's, it's okay to fail if you don't want like uh, something to be like a hero culture built around egos, then it's important that everyone's living up to that, whether, you know, no matter where you are in the, in the organization. So this next is a, an example of something happening bottom up. So this is a fail wall um, that, that, that you can find in the office. And what it is is that um, people in a squad, they, they said, okay, like, let's celebrate failure. Let's not be afraid of it. So whenever they were to stand up and they were, you know, if something didn't go right, they would put it up here. Um, I think one that I saw once was, uh, I failed because I thought failure was a bad thing that was stuck up to this wall. So um, this is an example of just like a, a daily type thing that a team was doing to make it, make it an atmosphere where it was okay to, uh, to mess up or, or to look bad, which can be scary when you're new to a company and, and you're trying to figure out how it works. So. Um, so this is, yeah, again, something coming from the squad level up. And it also comes the other way down, right? So reinforcement and repetition. So um, Oscar Stuhl, our CTO, uh, has sent out emails, but also has made some internal blog posts about how we should be celebrating failures. Um, and how, you know, even noticing, okay, not, not only pointing out the wins that we've had, but also saying, okay, these things didn't go our way, but it's really great that that we're taking these risks and that we're trying, and what are all the things we can learn from it. Uh, so again, more of a top-down type approach to, to be modeling this behavior. Um, and this one's my favorite. So imagine this, it's your first day in the job, uh, first month, and you've just very, very publicly broken some firewall settings. So you're new to a company, you don't really know how, how things work, you've kind of got a little bit of a sense, you maybe read a little bit, um, but you end up taking down all the servers in London. What happens next? Oh, you might first mess up. <laughs> so, um, if I were Dima, I might be a little bit scared then. Other people chime in. Burn him, burn the witch. Congrats, welcome. <laughs> like me the most my first mess with Spotify, anyone in this channel, I think I broke DNS for Spotify.com. And Sherwin says, I broke Spotify.com. <laughs> and what's interesting here is, is these aren't only engineers. Um, NRH, Nick, Nick, he is actually the tribe lead, as we say, so the head of the engineering department. And he's kind of the first one to respond. And it's something that's totally organic. So he's responding to a new engineer, obviously like a little bit joking at first, but then saying, oh, that's, that's nothing. What about the time when I did this? So as a new engineer, you know, it feels like, okay, maybe it's not so bad, maybe it's not so scary. Um, Nate, he's, a, he's an engineering manager, and he's also chiming in, and sure, when he was an engineer. So you see that it's, it's this very organic thing across the entire level of the, of the company. Um, and then more people chime in. Um, David, who is working with products, says, welcome. After this is when Spotify adds you to the monthly payroll. <laughs> um, and the conversation goes on and on and on. No one breaks DNS like I do. I might agree, but I bet no one here overwrote the entire ash.spotify.net zone with long two records, except me. <laughs> um, 
and again, that was kind of like a competition back and forth between Jeremy and Dougie, who did more. <laughs> Fireballing on all authoritative slaves um, can start a competition, can bring, you talk to Pierre about his epic outage. Um, so it's kind of moved away from even just what happened with Dima to being sort of this you know, fun competition about who had actually made the worst mistake. And Frevin says, I liked it when I was slightly sloppy with cash headers on S3 items, which made clients hammer CloudFront so much that MK, who's the chief architect, came running down pretty much yelling, stop the presses because Amazon called with a surprisingly many digit dollar number for a future bill. Nobody deducted it for my salary, which I was happy about. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> Start sweating. So as you can see, it's not just, uh, it's not just a, Talk the talk type thing, but it's also a walk to walk, and you see that because we've um, because we've filtered, because we have culture interviews, because we know what's important to us, we're able to get people with this sort of mindset in, in the building. Um, from there, we're able to reinforce and adjust. Um, you could, in some ways, call call this conversation a form of feedback, um, trying to make sure people understand that that they should be taking risks, both in their personal development and technically. Um, and then also, as you see, modeling behavior and reiterating, okay, like, uh, it's, like failure is okay if we want to learn from things, we want to take risks. Any questions? What is this? What will happen if you repeat the same mistake twice three times? What would happen if you would repeat the same mistake three or four times? Um, that's definitely happened also, uh, and if we still, we still take the same same approach of trying to attack the problem and not not the person. Uh, usually, if, if, so, if it's possible to make the same mistake many times, and maybe it's something like in our in our systems or processes that's that are going wrong. Uh, but yeah, we, we would definitely try and dig deeper into that. Uh, but it, it doesn't just you know it's not like oh you can make one mistake and everything's fine and no one will you. But if you make a second mistake, no, it's not like that. Uh, more questions? Is there a I was going to oh, uh, ask you, as far as earlier you said, you know, trying to fail, do you mean, I just want to make sure, do you mean trying to succeed but learning from failure, or do you really mean trying to fail? No, yeah, I mean the, the <laughs> latter. <laughs> trying to succeed and learning from failure. Okay. Um, but I, I would say that there are examples of like trying to push people out of their comfort zone, right? Like uh, in personal development. I mean, we're what well, we do have like some sort of like fail over tests and such that we do. But uh, so that would be trying to fail. But uh, we, uh, if, you know, maybe we see someone who's who's working in their role, and you know, they could go to their stretch zone or they could go to their like super stretch zone. Sometimes it's worth trying to give people opportunities that are way out of their comfort zone so that they can okay, maybe that was too much for me, but then they end up sort of in that stretch zone. So it's not that you want to set someone up for failure, but to fail, but, uh, but it's, it's not like an outcome that was working forward. More questions? Uh, what was your biggest failure? What was my biggest failure? Yeah. Um, <coughs> this one. <laughs> um, I, I can I I have a lot of failures. <laughs> I don't know the biggest one. I'll, I guess I'll come back to that. Yeah, so uh, the Spotify engineering model is quite uh, well known. So my question is, how are learnings or successes and failures kind of shared with other tribes or fields with Spotify? So how are learnings and failures shared with other tribes and fields? Um, one thing we do is if we have like a company-wide uh, project, so or maybe just a really big project. So, for example, when we launched on PlayStation, we had like a series of project retrospectives after that. So we would do retrospectives with a lot of the people and teams who were involved, and then we would bubble that up into something bigger and something bigger. So we do have some process, like some sort of process in place for trying to learn from bigger failures. Um, and I would say, like, the guild is another good place where this type of learning happens. So uh, in the Agile Guild, for example, we have a lunch and learn on Mondays, and people can come and present something, or maybe they can just talk about it. So uh, 
I would actually say the Guild is a tool for sharing some of those learnings. We also have, like, people send emails or their blog posts, or sometimes um, we have internal unconferences. So maybe we'll have a mobile unconference or uh, a back end unconference, and that's when a lot of, of sharing goes on also. Uh, and I think with especially the Agile Guild, because you have coaches in it and they're working with a lot of teams, uh, there's a lot of sharing going on there. Uh, do you find the cultural filter to be easier in certain countries compared to others, or is or is it sort of generally the same? Um, in, in terms of Spotify specifically? Yes. Or, yeah. Um, so we, our engineering offices are the U.S. and Sweden. So we have Stock, uh, Stockholm, Gothenburg, uh, Boston, New York, and San Francisco. Um, I. I would say it hasn't. I, I wouldn't say it's been so hard. Um, I think one thing that helps is that we're a Swedish company, and I think that a lot of these concepts about collaboration and not not being super hierarchical and kind of like everyone um, being an important contributor. I would say that's something that at least to me feels very Swedish. So I think being a Swedish company and having that like kind of fundamental culture from the bottom up um, has definitely been a big influence and it's been super helpful. Uh, but I but I also see people who are hired in the US share some of these values. Um, and if anything, hiring there goes quicker than in Sweden, so I'm not I'm not really sure that I've seen it. But but yeah, no, not between the US and Sweden anyway, but maybe somewhere else, but we don't have engineering offices there, so I haven't seen Last questions? Cool. I guess my failure for now is that I can't answer your questions. So. <laughs> I'll come back, back to something. Okay, thank you so much. And um, yeah, my slides are are online at my uh, at my website, it's just first name, last name .com. And if you have questions, I'll be around today and tomorrow, so just um, ask me. Thank you.